Mountain Rescue is a 24-hour day, seven days a week, 365 days a year voluntary service. It saves lives in the most remote and adverse terrain. The Mountain Rescue Association, known as the MRA, was established in 1959, making them the oldest search and rescue association in North America. Today, the MRA consists of 100 teams across eight regions of the U.S. and Canada, representing over 3,000 volunteer rescue mountaineers. We work to improve the quality, availability, and safety of mountain search and rescue. The Mountain Rescue Association has grown to become the premier mountain search and rescue resource in North America. The MRA provides scenario-based, peer accreditation for rescue teams in mountain-specific rescue disciplines. Each team trains rigorously to national guidelines, practicing a variety of rescue scenarios to better prepare them for their next emergency. MRA teams perform over 5,000 search and rescue operations in North America each year. When needed, our teams work with local, regional, and federal agencies, as well as state and provisional authorities and medical professionals to assist those in need and help save lives. We are a hiker that stumbles, a climber that falls, or a child that wanders away from their family. Mountain Rescue Association teams are always there to help. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Our professional volunteers dedicate themselves to saving lives through rescue and mountain safety education. Operation, go for operations. Team one, heading into the field. Mountain Rescue Association. Courage, commitment, compassion. Hey everybody, welcome. Charlie Schmansky here. Uh, it's good to have you all for what I think is our sixth Third Thursday presentation, ask you all to go to the lower left corner of your Zoom screen and make sure you're muted while we do a couple of opening uh, presentations. Um, first thing I'm going to try to do is um, get to where you can see me and some of the other present presenters. To, uh, we've got a few things to say, so welcome everybody. Um, just want to uh, reinforce for everybody that these third Thursdays are happening every month, but now you need to have your members only password to get the uh, into the members only pass um, the members only side of our website in order to uh, get into these programs, especially important because next month we are going to have a presentation on sort of mission critiques and it's not something we want to post access to on the uh, on the website. Um, so with that, be sure you check every month. This password may change, but by now you're all getting familiar with our new members only website, uh, sorry, sorry, portion of our webpage. Um, that's where you're gonna find these links. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go back to our uh, presentation uh, slideshow and I just wanna walk you through a few things. I wanna first off start by saying uh, my thanks to uh, whole bunch of people who help us out in these third Thursday, uh, third Thursday programs. Uh, in particular, Michael St. John, who you'll hear from in just a minute, who really is the guy who came up with this concept. Ella Foskett, who's also on Michael's team, uh, does the marketing support for us. Gary Ferris, our webmaster is amazing. Don Wilson, who I think we're gonna hear from in a few minutes on our sponsor for the night. And Ava Sophia Shemansky does a bunch of our Zoom hosting and assisting with our Q&A. So with that, uh, next month is a very special quarterly uh, presentation as part of our third Thursday. So it's part of the normal event. Um, and Michael St. John, the creator of this uh, series, had a great idea of let's do quarterly uh, mission debriefs so we can learn real time uh, from uh, folks who've uh, you know, had lessons taught that maybe we can all learn from. So with that, Michael, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing and put you give you a chance to go on screen and say hello and uh, give us an update on next month. Thanks, Charlie. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to the next month. We have two mission reviews. 
The first one's going to be with Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office, who's going to do a review of an avalanche incident that actually just occurred weeks ago um, uh, that involved four fatalities and a significant response and interagency coordination. And then the second review is going to be by the Inyo County Sheriff's Office uh, that's going to cover um, mapping glitches to lead to the search starting in a completely different area. And then uh, the importance of situational awareness during aviation operations uh, that was part of the same incident. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. If you guys are considering doing a mission review, the next ones will be in July. Um, I've got one slot spoken for, still one open. Um, the host, the agency that ran the incident is the one that does a mission review. And then I just moderate uh, the question and answer period. Uh, so uh, reach out to me if you're interested or have a, a good case that you think others would benefit from the lessons learned. Thank you. Hey, Michael, thank you for the idea. And also just real quickly, do you want to address the issue of whether we're going to be recording these presentations and uh, posting them on the MRA website, even inside the members only? Because I, our sense is uh, join this live, but that'll, that'll be your opportunity. Um, and we want to be careful to, to even put that as a recording behind Thanks, the Charlie. MRA uh, website. Obviously, um, you know, what they're going to cover is sensitive information. And we want to create and foster an environment where people feel comfortable sharing the information without worry of it being, you know, broadcast to a much larger evidence and put under the microscope for any scrutiny. So we do not record uh, these sessions. Uh, addition additionally, um, uh, we um, um, just limit to questions to, you know, uh, we definitely don't want to run a critique of anybody's incidents. Um, and our, the goal is, is, when mistakes are sometimes made or whatever learning opportunities there are um, that we foster an environment that feel people feel comfortable, you know, sharing stuff so that we can get the most benefit out of it. Thanks, Thanks Michael. And, and again, tonight's presentation by Dr. Smith will be available. It'll be available on the MRA website. Um, uh, but these mission critiques, which again are every quarter will, will not be. Um, so Michael, thank you so much for, uh, the work that you've done to to create this uh, uh, this great series and this great quarterly uh, portion of it. So appreciate that. Um, next, I want to turn it to Chris Roosh out in Pennsylvania. Uh, they are going to be hosting the spring meeting in June. And uh, Chris, you want me to go uh, off share so you can be on camera? Why don't I do that? Either way. Um, so we uh, just want to remind everybody that the MRA conference is happening this year, and uh, we're hoping to see lots of you come out here and join us in uh, Pennsylvania in uh, June 10th through the 13th. Planning for the conference is in full swing, um, and uh, we're, we're starting to see an uptick in interest. We got four new sponsors that confirmed this week, um, uh, including Cal Topo, CMC, Rock and Rescue, and uh, Vida in Clanida, which is an, uh, a helicopter rescue um, uh, organization. So um, come out, join us, check out the program, and we hope to see you in June. Chris, thanks for all the planning that you guys have been doing going back well over a year now. So excited at the prospect uh, that we're going to be together and uh, appreciate all the work that you guys are doing. Uh, I'm particularly glad that you mentioned CMC Rescue. So CMC is, is the host for tonight. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to introduce Dawn Wilson with Alpine Rescue Team. But more importantly, Dawn is the, um, the coordinator of all our sponsorships uh, for MRA. And Dawn, I trust that you're here. I'm going to stop share and let you go on camera and then we'll show the CMC video, Dawn. Maybe I'm even so sorry not to delay you guys because what I have to say is not super exclusive about me. But um, yes, I'm super excited about CMC because they are excited about going to the conference and uh, there's Steve Wilson there. Too. And uh, so anyway, the point is, Charlie, throw CMC's video up. They are our sponsor for MRA. They've been a silver sponsor for years and they are our sponsor for tonight. They have a very cool little video. I will tell you the first couple seconds, there is no sound, so don't be alarmed. Just watch, use your brain, and then watch again. Thanks guys. Here, 
here we go. CMC Rescue. Don, thanks for all your great work. You bet. Bring sponsors in, and here's a little a little clip from CMC. What was wrong with the first picture is that we are connected into the large loop in the frost knot. Whenever you use a frost knot, it's important you tie into the small loop. When tied in the redundant fashion with one inch tubular webbing, this is a, a breaking strength of approximately 8,200 pounds. What's wrong with this picture is the vertical litter harness is tied over the top of the blade line, preventing the litter from going fully upright when transitioning over the edge. Now we'll show you the right way to put this together. With the belay line tied at the head over the top of the main line, this will allow the litter to properly pivot at the edge. Reminder to everybody, CMC is one of our sponsors. Just make sure you think about our sponsors when you're making any kind of equipment decisions and such because um, CMC, we've had Petzl, we've had a couple different sponsors so far on Third Thursdays and they really support what we do. If you ever have any questions for them, comments, suggestions, feel free to reach out to me like someone did recently for Garmin and I will put you in touch with them as needed. Thanks guys and girls. Thanks, Dawn. And uh, yeah, I just want to echo what Dawn said. CMC has been with the MRA forever. Um, and we're just so grateful for their sponsorship, which has been uh, going on for a long, long time. And now, without further ado, it's a real privilege for me, especially tonight, to introduce a friend of many, many years, uh, Dr. Will Smith, who's going to share a little bit with drones. I don't want to take too much time. If I were to spend time going through Dr. Smith's entire bio, we'd eat up the entire 45 minutes we've given him for the night. So here you go. I hope you're good at speed reading. Um, first of all, Will has practiced medicine on six continents. It, it begs the question, Will, can you not hold down a job that you got to bounce from continent to continent? You can see, ladies and gentlemen, he works as an EMS emergency medicine physician in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, one of the best places in the country. Uh, works with the University of Washington School of Medicine, medical director for the entire US National Park Service and co-medical director throughout the Northern um, Wyoming, Utah area in terms of um, Grand Teton National Park, Teton County, Sar Bridger, Teton National Forest in Jackson Hole. Um, and most recently the uh, Air Rescue Commission of ICAR the International Commission for Alpine Rescue, for which I'm the president of the Air Rescue Commission, um, has developed a, a drone working group uh, with two representatives from all four commissions. And Will is the Avalanche Commission rep to that new drone working group that's getting a lot of attention because it's the first ever, from what we can tell, international drone work group. And uh, just a real privilege, Dr. Will Smith, to turn... Uh, uh, turn everything over to you, and if I can do this well, I'm going to give you the screen share, and uh, thanks for being here. Well, appreciate you have, having uh, you as a part of this. Great. Thanks, Charlie, and see if I can uh, hit my slides back up here as well. Great. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks to Mike St. John, who had the pleasure of doing a rigging for rescue class back in Yosemite many years ago. So uh, good name, names keep circulating back around. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about uh, unmanned aerial systems or drones. Actually, I had the pleasure to work with uh, Garth Bruce and Doug McCall and a few others that are actually kind of in the MRA and actually doing some of this drone. So I'm not sure I'm the uh, most expert person to give this presentation, but definitely working with the ICAR on that uh, international drone working group, which has been a pleasure to see what people are doing with this kind of around the world. And there's definitely increasing capabilities pretty much everywhere we go. <clears throat> this uh, picture here 
is uh, working with our Matrice model last fall, last winter up at the ski area. Um, that's my son there, Zach, who's my uh, expert assistant. And so, yeah, just uh, kind of the, the lessons learned and kind of the, the development of the program, uh, what we learned here in the Teton. So uh, with that, no conflicts or kind of financial disclosures. Uh, this is really just uh, um, some of the products we're talking about, like DJI is what uh, uh, we've used locally, but there's a lot of other projects out there. And so just like anytime you're looking at uh, a product for what you're doing for a specific mission set, making sure you're going out and evaluating all those different uh, different items. So as Charlie mentioned, uh, I wear a different uh, set of hats. Uh, one of my uh, main one is uh, an EMS and emergency medicine physician at our local hospital in Jackson. That's uh, really where I uh, kind of earn all the money to pay all the bills and the rest of the stuff is just all fun. So uh, like you mentioned, I'm co-medical director with Dr. AJ Wheeler for pretty much all the kind of first response EMS agencies in uh, Jackson Hole and the surrounding area. So it's been a great opportunity to really blend <clears throat> that capability from the park service to our search and rescue team, uh, to our fire EMS, to the forest service. And so really having everybody work on the same set of protocols, doing the patient care guidelines, and actually with the UAV programs, we've been able to integrate some of those as well. I'm actually uh, on the road right now. So I've uh, got my army hat on and down in San Antonio doing a dive medicine and hyperbaric class. So uh, with that, uh, with the army reserve hat, I'm the uh, medical director for the army EMS program office. So looking at uh, coordinating EMS across all the Army installations across the globe. Also do some uh, SME work with DARPA and so some of the early on UIV projects as well as the other scientific advancements. Uh, it's been a great opportunity to work with them and then do several other different uh, uh, medical directions for some other agencies that are out there that uh, get me to some fun far places across the globe. And so our team, uh, Teton County Search and Rescue, uh, we were formed in 1993. We have about uh, 30 to 40 volunteers to uh, basically be able to respond like a lot of the volunteer teams kind of in the MRA organization, 24 seven, 365. You just never know when the next call is gonna come. Sometimes we'll go a couple of weeks without a call and then sometimes we'll go three calls in the same day. So we average about 75 to 100 missions annually <clears throat> over the last couple and in weeks to months, we've definitely had a uptick in some avalanches and snowmobile injuries. And so just never know when that next call is going to come. <laughs> so talking about unmanned aerial systems or drones and really how they can be used in SAR. And so it's just like everything else we do in medicine, everything else we do in SAR, it's really balancing kind of those risks to the benefit and really trying to figure out what that end mission goal is going to be. And so with that, this is a picture that we had on uh, avalanche recovery uh, last year uh, during kind of the height of COVID. Again, just trying to navigate all the, the, the typical search and rescue kind of realms and problems. But then uh, COVID definitely kind of added to that next layer as well. And this is a little hella spot that we stamped out. Uh, as we were getting close to where the, uh, the burial field was and just uh, working on helping do some of the recon and recovery. So just to help a little bit about just the, uh, the, the terminology around this, uh, there's definitely, I know people on the call that's probably old hat, but uh, some people may be seeing some of this for the first time. So really UAS or unmanned aerial system, that's really the official and the, and the most technical term. Uh, drone is a, kind of the lay term. There's definitely some realms and some groups that uh, drone has a little bit of a negative connotation. So UAS. Uh, UAV is, is just really the unmanned aerial vehicle, but it's really a whole system that uh, puts it all together. You've got different types. There's a fixed wing, uh, so it's more like an airplane, but it's unmanned. Uh, you've got rotor, and then uh, sometimes you hear uh, VTOL, a VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing. Um, typically, that's been like the quadcopters and the octocopters, uh, but now they are developing some uh, fixed wings, so kind of like the Osprey aircraft that can go from a, a tilt rotor, so it can do a vertical takeoff, but then switch to a, a fixed wing uh, forward flight. And so those definitely have some increased capabilities looking at the, the size and the weight and the range and the altitude. And again, the, the drones or the UAVs really have some of the same limitations that uh, manned aircraft have and the same aerodynamics. You've got a ground-based controller or ground-based station, uh, basically whether or not that's fixed, whether or not you're looking at some of the military UAVs and they've got uh, full-on 
basically bunkers or uh, kind of different trailers where they uh, kind of work and doing the ground based uh, stations for those and, and sometimes it can be kind of really proximate. So you're actually kind of a visual line of sight or sometimes it can actually be across the globe. So it just depends on the uh, amount of technology and the comm architecture that you have in place. Just like with manned aircraft, you have a PIC or a pilot in command. And so really that's the, the person in charge of the whole operation. But that may be the not the person operating the controls. Um, the person operating the controls is the one that's actually kind of manning the, the controller. Um, you may have a visual observer kind of looking for other hazards, looking for other things. But really, it's still the pilot in command that's overall in charge of the mission. And as we've really been learning and uh, talking a lot about crew resource management is how do you optimize all these different things? How do you optimize communication, kind of risk stratification, risk management? And so again, all those concepts still come into play even when you're working with these uh, UAVs. The picture here is the uh, DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. And that's uh, one of the, the aircraft that we have on our uh, search and rescue team in our kind of arsenal right now. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a bit. As we're talking a little bit more about UAS or unmanned aerial systems in this talk, uh, just realizing there's a lot of other unmanned aerial developments out there, um, both under, un, unmanned underwater vehicles, <clears throat> unmanned ground vehicles, um, some of the cave based systems and different things out there, uh, confined space, structure collapse, kind of urban search and rescue. So just realize this, uh, this category of unmanned vehicles is really developing in all these different realms across the, the spectrum. And so I think one of the things that comes to mind again is the uh, the hazards that come with these. So again, kind of uh, working kind of with the news that we've seen over in Saudi Arabia, where kind of the UAVs kind of took out some oil fields. Uh, looking at the the critical or national security and infrastructure, certainly um, sometimes some of these are hard to defeat. Um, but again, really trying to focus for what we're doing from the search and rescue is really coordinating uh, with that. <clears throat> Deconflicting the airspace is probably the one of the biggest concerns and, and as Charlie and kind of other people have talked with the, the Air Commission with ICAR, it's really making sure that we deconflict this with our manned aircraft. And that can be done safely really with kind of that local and regional command and control. So instead of working separate from the incident command system, actually working in it. Uh, this flyer on the right is uh, what the, uh, the US uh, Department of Agriculture and some of the other wildland fire working groups I've really been putting out there. Um, there's definitely some the wildland fires that have had uh, UAVs or drones flying and really grounded some of the air operations till they've been able to, to get the uh, aircraft identified and either grounded or kind of uh, mitigated. So some of these, uh, the newer, this is a control station uh, screenshot from one of the GGI platforms that I've been flying. Um, some of these uh, do track other transponders, so the ADSB. Um, this was a structure fire that we were flying our uh, small aircraft with at night. And the uh, aircraft that you can see on the image there basically gave me a warning that uh, a passenger aircraft is approaching to send as soon as possible. And so this was actually an air ambulance that was flying over the fire to kind of see what was going on. So again, just whenever you're in the airspace, airspace, just making sure that you're kind of understanding and knowing what's out there. As I'll talk about here in a little bit, the FAA with the uh, kind of ID now is basically trying to be able to get better airspace deconfliction between the manned and unmanned aircraft. And as we know, it's not just the search and rescue world that we're talking about. It's Amazon, it's UPS, it's all these different other uh, commercial, agriculture, all these other different uh, uh, organizations that are going to be kind of coming into this unmanned airspace world. So for us in uh, Teton County, uh, we definitely have uh, the mission profile that, that spans the spectrum. So we've got swift water to avalanche to cave to high angle to low angle, um, <clears throat> basically do the, the patient evacuation. And so really trying to figure out where the best place to integrate unmanned aerial systems in to actually make a difference and not make sure that it's just the, the newest toy, um, but actually make sure that it's actually having a positive impact and not degrading what we already have in place. So establishing a, a UAS program for search and rescue, um, you really need to underfly the, the regulations and how to certify 
that's uh, what's the right training and equipping, uh, figuring out kind of which of the UAS platforms that's out there. Um, really, the technology is continuing to develop even on a year to year basis. And so the uh, the platforms that we bought within the last year or two, there's already newer, better models out there. So um, the battery length, all those different things are improving. And so the, the UASs are really hitting the cusp of where they're becoming that uh, the, the right option for some of the settings. And so really just going through and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the concepts for search and rescue operations, which, uh, uh, which areas should we be able to uh, kind of really make the biggest impact with these, uh, these uh, new toys that are out there. And then really just deploying for the mission. So making sure you've got all those uh, separate uh, uh, training, the plans, all of them ready to implement in a safe manner. I think one of the big things, especially what we've done in the Tetons, is the uh, the partnerships. And so the uh, the models that we've had, we've actually uh, combined with the the Teton County Search and Rescue, which is underneath the Sheriff's Office, as well as Jackson Hole Fire AMS. And so those are the two lead organizations. Uh, I just happen to be the the medical director for both. And so flying, uh, like I was saying, that one picture from before was flying at night for a structure fire. And so again, really creating a pool of UAV pilots um, to be able to work across some of these spectrums. We may be having all of our search and rescue members that need to be deployed in the field. So having kind of other emergency responders that can fly uh, when all the uh, primary uh, responders to that organization are tied up with that immediate mission. We're also working with uh, Highway Patrol, um, the Forest Service and the wildland fire community has definitely been embracing a lot more of these. Uh, the National Park Service, uh, working with them a little bit in the Tetons. Um, once you start working with some of the federal roles, there's different rules and regulations that they have to follow. Uh, we're working with uh, Jackson Hole Mountain Resort, the ski area, Fish and Wildlife Service, our uh, emergency management. Uh, we've definitely used them to help fly for some uh, after disaster recon. So flooding, um, other kind of wind events. And so again, there's just getting to be more and more opportunities for these uh, uh, UAVs to be uh, deployed, not just for immediate search and rescue activities, but also the, the surrounding emergency first response space. So looking at some of the certifying regulations, I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds here because uh, you can definitely, if you're interested in this, go get your Part 107, which is your uh, remote pilot certificate for the small unmanned aircraft systems. Um, there's all sorts of authorizations and waivers. Um, working with the uh, ICAR, the European Aviation Safety Agency, the EASA, has basically got a lot of the mirrored protocols, a lot of the mirrored regulations. And so again, just trying to make sure that as these get to be more and more prominent, that uh, uh, we're making sure that we do it safely. So if you're looking at the, uh, the small UAS, so again, that's just the definitions that are out there. So if you're uh, more than 13 years old, uh, you have to register. And so if you're under 13, then you need to make sure that you got a responsible adult. Uh, the small UAS, if you're looking at the, uh, the, the size, so that's from 0.55 pounds to 55 pounds. And so that's, that's a bit of a range, but then that kind of excludes some of those big military type drones. Um, some of those are used in the commercial space, but again, fall outside of this uh, specific definition. Whether or not you're doing it for recreation versus commercial versus public safety, again, all those have slightly different regulations and different uh, reporting and different uh, pathways for what you're doing for your in-mission goal. So we start talking about uh, visual line of sight um, versus beyond visual line of sight, and that's the BVLOS. And so that's something that's uh, kind of important for us to search and rescue, because if we can actually see what we need to see, then we're already there. But how do we go behind or beyond that visual line of sight? And so that's kind of one of those things that requires waivers and special uh, recognition with the FAA. Generally, if we're flying within the Part 107 regulations, we're 400 feet or lower above ground level. And so again, just uh, deconflicting with some of the aircraft that may be flying higher. And so we've actually done some training in the Tetons where we're working with our local helicopter pilots. And so you just create a geofence. So either that's a vertical geofence, say I'm gonna be flying on this side of trees, you'll be on that side, or we'll do a vertical kind of a geofence. So I'll be below 400 feet and the pilot will be above. And so again, just making sure you're communicating with the manned aircraft or communicating between multiple UAVs and maybe operating in the same geospatial area. So again, lots of uh, different uh, abilities to uh, command and control and coordinate, which is really important to really deconflict that airspace. Um, this uh, picture here is uh, the 
from the FAA. So there's definitely some guidance that they've put. So the public safety and government users, you can click on that and they can help guide you through uh, some of the regulations and, and some of the steps needed if you're really going to be starting a program from the, the bottom up. And then there's some micro UAVs that are UASs that are less than one gram. And so again, there's just getting to be a big expanse of uh, everything that's out there. So for our, and what we're working in is uh, the public safety or the government space. So again, looking at some of those authorizations and waivers, um, looking at kind of some sometimes local kind of geopolitical jurisdictions and rules apply. So you need to make sure that you're, uh, you're following all of those. Uh, this group on the right is the uh, dronerresponders.org. Uh, it's a, a nonprofit of uh, public safety and uh, looking at kind of doing what we're doing both in the fire service with search and rescue, law enforcement. Again, each one of those just has some slightly different connotations, but uh, a good, good organization out there when you join, they've definitely got some samples of what uh, uh, people have put together for different uh, SOPs and uh, different uh, uh, protocols, different trainings. And so again, a uh, pretty good reference for uh, looking to see what's already been out there and uh, not have to build everything from the scratch. So the, the new parts of the, uh, the, the drone uh, kind of world is the, the remote ID rule. So this is just uh, came out earlier this year. Um, it's gonna be uh, drone manufacturers must comply by September 16th, uh, 2022. And so that's gonna be putting basically in a, a transponder type uh, chip into the drone so that you're gonna be able to be identified. Those have to be regulated. And then if you're flying your own, uh, it's got to be uh, all uh, drones have to comply by September of 2023. So those are definitely some uh, uh, newer rules that are just coming out. So the two uh, <clears throat> devices that we have, um, this is the uh, DJI Mavic 2 Enterprise Dual. And that's about uh, kind of when it came out for the full systems, about $3,000. About a 30 minute flight time is both uh, optical as well as IR capability. It's actually, as you can see here in the picture, it's got a speaker that you can mount on top so you can actually record or uh, broadcast uh, certain messages. So, hi, we're with search and rescue, stay with you are, um, but it doesn't have the ability to have a microphone to come back. That hopefully will be on one of the next stages. Uh, it's got a light that you can uh, place on top as well for some night operations. And again, it's still about a 30 minute flight time. The larger platform that we have is the DJI Matrice 210, uh, about $25,000 with both the uh, optical and infrared cameras. The, the IR camera is about $10,000 a piece. Um, so it gives you about, again, 30 minute flight time, about a, a two kilogram uh, payload capacity. Um, there's there's different products that are out there. So Life Seeker is uh, kind of like a mobile cell phone tower that uh, has got some uh, attachments that you can put on here. Uh, there's There's been some like life uh, life uh, rings that have been dropped for surf rescue uh, by lifeguards in Australia. So there's definitely some more capabilities with this. It's got about a seven kilometer operation range is what the uh, company touts, but uh, uh, you definitely have the limitations to, to get to that full extent. So the limitations with uh, any of these UAV platforms or battery life, again, and that's kind of really where the technology is just getting to the point that they're actually kind of reasonable. Um, 30 minutes isn't a whole long time if you're gonna go a significant distance, but if you're just working to uh, go over the edge of a road or if you're looking to do a, a special confined area, uh, it's definitely got the increased capability. Um, prior, uh, probably five or six years ago, the, the capacity was much, much less. Still limited by the flight conditions, by weather and altitude. However, you're, you're sometimes with some of these platforms willing to push that margin a little bit to, to risk a lot, to save a lot. So you might not put up a helicopter, you might put up one of these drones and, and be willing to lose $3,000 to, to really save a life. And so again, as you're working through your operational risk management, making those decisions from the with the incident commander, um, really seeing which of these platforms might still be able to, to make an impact on the, the rescue. Anytime you start putting a payload onto these, so you still just worry about, again, all those aircraft dynamics, the center of gravity. Uh, as we mentioned, the airspace conflicts, that's kind of a very high priority. 
And then you got to make sure that you got the right equipment to the right operators trained. Um, the batteries on these aircraft have to be cycled uh, within a week or two, they start to decharge. And so you have to make sure that you got a continuous uh, program to make sure the batteries are charged up. You have to make sure that the firmware and software is continually upgraded. And so again, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller parts rather than just getting one and flying it for the mission. You just can't leave it on the shelf and, and go pick it up six months later. So the sensor packages um, for the uh, visual optics. So this is the uh, DJI Matrice 210. It's flying it right now, 400 feet AGL. And with this, we've got the Z30 camera that's got 180 times zoom. So uh, looking down here at that, <clears throat> uh, the Quonsets, uh, you can see the, uh, the, with the zoom, you can see their license plate on that vehicle. You can see the two operators. And so again, looking in, in some terrain for usually an object that's a high interest. Um, it's hard to search that level of zoom kind of over a wide area, but once you do see something, once you find something, um, you can definitely interrogate it very easily and decide if that's something that's real or not. Other sensor packages out there. So again, the, uh, the FLIR or the forward looking infrared. So on the image on the left, that was actually a car that went through some of the, uh, the cable restraining barriers as the truck lost its brakes on Teton Pass. And so the top is the visual and then the bottom is the infrared. And so you can really see the, the brakes on that trailer um, where they got hot. You can see the engine on that uh, highway patrol vehicle. Um, some of the other concepts is potentially if you had somebody ejected down the hill that was still alive that had a, a different temperature that was uh, different than the environment, you might be able to see them. And so again, just gives you really a different perspective of what's going on in the scene, both the visual as well as the infrared space. Looking at uh, the middle pictures there, so looking at potentially some building searches. So this is uh, flying in through a window on a, a fire tower. And once you get inside, certainly if there's a fire, if there's different uh, um, bodies laying around, so being able to uh, do different type of search and rescues with that. Looking at some of the, uh, the next <clears throat> uh, uh, sensor packages that are coming out. So looking at thermal, looking at multispectral. So again, looking at different wavelengths, to looking at hyperspectral, looking at LIDAR. Again, lots of different possibilities. And on the sensor package space, um, we're just uh, scratching the top of the surface, um, being able to uh, detect what's out there. So looking at the, the concept of operations, what we do a lot in, uh, in search, search and rescue is lost person search. So um, trying to, uh, once we find them, are they alive and we need to do that high risk rescue or are they dead or deceased and we need to change this from a uh, high op tempo to a low op tempo, kind of really adjusting that risk and just going to recovery mode. And so with that, um, the top couple of pictures on the right there, so that's uh, playing hide and go seek with my daughter when I got uh, my first one. So just going around the house and you can see her kind of hidden down in the bushes and you can see that white hot spot. And then you can look on the uh, visual side, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Uh, <clears throat> you can see her just uh, with the, the regular optics is, is more difficult to see. So that's the, some of the, the, the ease of being able to use these to help detect people. The bottom right picture was a search and rescue that we had a couple of years ago. On July 1st, we uh, found uh, a, a missing person's shoe that was reported missing down by the water's edge. And so we're able to do a quick hasty search to see if that person was in that kind of right immediate local area. So swift water rescue, um, I'm sure which uh, many of us do on their call right now, but this is an ability to get a rapid and fast eyes on a person. So this was a uh, actually a fire EMS training opportunity um, for the swift water, but being able to immediately get this launched within 30 seconds to a minute once you come on scene, figure out where the person's at. And so as you can see, this is fairly different, difficult area to access. Um, the, the camera footage will kind of screen over to where the road's at. And so how can you leapfrog resources to get your downstream safeties? How can you get somebody kind of upstream in the water to, to go after them? Um, but again, just an amazing capability. Again, realizing the limitations that you've got to uh, have about 30 minutes battery life. Lucky with the DJ platforms and most of the other ones, it gives you kind of a return to home time. So you're not gonna fly it all the way out and not have any battery left. Um, those start automatically coming back to home once you hit that, uh, uh, the smart batteries capability of calculating how far they've got to come back home. 
but again, really being able to see if somebody's moving in that, if they're not, are they alive, are they dead, are they going to be able to help self-recover, are you going to need to have a total recovery, do you need to have a tethered swimmer, do you need to have some sort of jet boat or other capabilities out there. So again, just uh, um, sometimes depending on all the different factors, the right tool for the rescue. So this is what the uh, IR looks like on that same image. And so generally the data card, you're able to uh, look at one or the other on your controller. But once you pull the data card off, you've got all this lifetime or this kind of pastime image. So you can actually take that back. And in, if you're working multiple operational periods, have some other people potentially scan kind of all that data that you've uh, you picked up. So other concepts of operations for us here in the Tetons um, is we get a lot of car over the edges. So whether or not that's on Teton Pass or this uh, top is from a, a car that went off the side of the road into the river. And so how can you get eyes on that quicker while you're getting people suited up, whether or not you're getting your kind of rigging system set up. And so being able to, again, decide is this kind of a, a live rescue and, or, or is this somebody that's deceased and recovery? Sometimes it's still hard to tell, but sometimes it can be pretty obvious as well. So uh, just uh, different operations out there. This was a uh, wildland fire that we had start, uh, just uh, being able to uh, see what's in that uh, geographical area, see how fast the fire is spreading. Um, this kind of bottom left is where I set up the little helipad. Um, so good, uh, again, making sure that you're deconflicting your landing zone, making sure that uh, everybody is staying safe in a way, recognizing that uh, that uh, there's some UAV operations going on. There's definitely kind of incident command vests that are out there for UAV teams and all those things. So you can definitely kind of go to the, 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 the level that you find appropriate out there. This is the, uh, the video footage from that uh, wildland fire. And so again, we were on the initial attack, the, uh, the fixed and uh, kind of rotor wing aircraft are still about 20 to 30 minutes out. So again, just being able to get that immediate kind of eyes on the initial attack, which was interesting about this as well is the, uh, the video footage actually helped in the investigation. So it actually, kind of after the fact, the Forest Service actually used this to help figure out exactly what caused the fire. As you're looking, you can kind of see where your personnel are. You can see kind of how fast that uh, flame front's advancing, potentially being able to do some early recognition to make sure that you're not going to get some uh, people trapped and kind of, uh, again, just that additional situational awareness. As you start going up and above, you can start seeing kind of what what other structures or what other uh, like uh, communication towers may be threatened by the fire. And so it's just the ability to just get an amazing amount of information. The things we're still working on from this standpoint is how do you get this information from just the view screen for the person flying the, the aircraft to the incident commander or operations section chief to be able to get that information disseminated rather than just on a small iPad or a phone. And so there's different techniques that are out there. Um, HDMI cables, some RF kind of uh, radio frequency uh, transmitters. And so again, just uh, working as this information and technology matures, how do you kind of optimize every all this information that you're getting out there? So you can see there in the center of the frame now, that's actually kind of one of the uh, cell towers that uh, supplies the area. As we start panning out, you can definitely see some of these other structures. And so we ended up kind of doing activation of uh, evacuation of these other areas as the fire continued to spread and actually quite, uh, quite fast. Another incident that we had this summer was a, uh, <clears throat> a three balloon mass casualty incident. Uh, so about 30 plus patients involved in all the three balloons had a big wind event. Basically the balloons uh, were knocked to the ground and then basically drugged. So as you can see uh, across these uh, prairies, kind of in this top center picture, um, you've got a balloon all the way on that north end, you've got a balloon in the center, and then you got a balloon all the way down on that south end. So ended up having three divisions for the rescue. 
And so again, for the incident commander to put all this information together in a rapid ability to get a UAV up in the air to especially kind of for a, a large scene to be able to see and get a visual reference of everything that's going on. So um, again, we had a helicopter came in for a critical patient. So making sure that you're doing good communication and deconflict the space for your kind of drone operations versus your helicopters versus your other assets that may be going on. Avalanche, definitely what we've been seeing quite a bit of in the last few weeks, but uh, these are some of the concepts that uh, we're working on for our kind of area is uh, how can you potentially use these for forecasting? How can you use them for mitigation? And then once an event occurs, how do you can find a quickly burial location and then looking at some of the uh, the next steps and kind of some of the larger UAV platforms, how can you potentially provide treatment and even evacuation for some slightly bigger drones? And the military has been working with some of these things, not quite ready for prime time SAR yet, but uh, um, <clears throat> the avalanche forecasting, again, how can you think about using drones or uh, multiple drones to be able to look and, and see what the data is across that whole slope versus just a small pit that may be dug versus just a, a small other area. And so being able to fly up and down the slide path, be able to get density, depths, cornices, layers, temperature, all these different things with this, the, the newer sensor packages that are out there. So um, not quite there yet, but uh, we're gonna be there pretty quick and close. Looking at avalanche mitigation, so how can you uh, kind of rig your UAV to drop bombs? Unfortunately, FAA kind of thinks that's weaponizing, um, but uh, uh, being able to use that is a limiting right now. But and as we continue to work and, and, and kind of show best practices, potentially be able to prove that this actually kind of is a safe thing that can be done with the right uh, controls in place. Looking for av avalanche burial detection. And so once the events occurred, so usually using it for visual. And so again, kind of doing that whole slope analysis. So being able to look up, up and down the slide path, looking for visual clues, gloves, ski poles, looking for trajectories of where the, the body may have slid from the last point. Um, this is a picture in the center here from the, the newspaper that uh, caught some of our uh, rescue on our one April avalanche last year. Um, this is me flying from down near the incident command post, uh, flying up to where we had a probe line. And so again, just being able to get that information and share it. Uh, we were, unfortunately didn't fly and find the person the first day. We had to go into a second operational period. Um, but again, just uh, kind of all these technologies kind of used at the right time and the right interface can really kind of improve your effectiveness. Looking for other sensor technologies onto the UAV, so regular avalanche transceivers, the 457 kilohertz, uh, being able to potentially look at RECO, kind of the infrared, being able to look at the, the multi or the hyperspectral, so being able to, uh, what the avalanche dogs smell when they're actually out there on the slope, can you put a sensor on a drone to be able to detect that as well, um, being able to get it out there quicker, being able to potentially decrease the risk to either kind of, uh, humans or canines out on the slide path, um, looking at LIDAR, looking at uh, different cell phone technologies, or potentially being able to look at a swarm drone technology. So get 15 drones with probe poles and detection sensors on the bottom and be able to, to use them in a GPS precise line to move it up and down a slide path. So again, just lots of different uh, ideas that are out there. Looking for communications, uh, being able to do a comm relay from the sky. As we know, in most of our AARs after search and rescue operations, communications was always a difficult thing. So how could you get a, a digital, digital architecture, put a repeater on a, a fixed wing drone to loiter in the sky um, could solve a lot of problems. Looking at night operations. And so again, this uh, the two pictures here on the left was uh, the structure fire that we had. So with the drone, we were able to see that the, uh, the fire engine was not putting the stream of water on the fire. They were actually shooting the stream of water over the fire. And so with the UAV, we were able to see and have them redirect that stream, um, not to mention to look at other temperature hotspots if you're doing an internal attack, uh, being able to detect uh, multiple of those things uh, from the air with just a different amount of sensors. Uh, looking at uh, sustained operations, and so if you're going to be in a remote environment, uh, how do you keep the batteries start charged up? 
um, did a uh, search and rescue deployment to central Nevada for a lost paraglider this summer. And so went down there and, and really kind of dialed in how to do prolonged operations when you don't have any sustained kind of uh, electricity other than maybe a car and a cigarette lighter. And so looking at some of the, uh, the goal zero battery panel charters, the uh, panners, panels. And so really kind of with that, UAV operations for a day. So when you kind of bring it all together is, is what, asset, what asset or which combination to use. So just like I mentioned at the start, everything in search and rescue is the risk, the benefit. So making sure you're using the right tool for the right reason, not just grabbing it off the shelf because it's the most shiny thing that we got, um, but actually making sure that it's going to be doing the, the right mission and doing it safely for us. And with that, uh, thanks for the opportunity. And I think Charlie's kind of raking up the questions for me to take after I get done. So I'm ready for them. Hey, thanks, Will. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of good ones. I've copied um, most of them and I'm gonna uh, try to catch the last two or three. Um, just a quick couple of reminders before I, uh, while I give uh, Will a chance to have a sip of water and get ready for this barrage of Q and A, but um, just a reminder to everybody that uh, this is recorded and we will be uh, uh, putting this up on the MRA website. So if you want to share it with your teams, make it a night, uh, weekly training or anything like that. I also want to tell you that the the hazard of drones is very, very real. I work with the Flight for Life program in Colorado as the Mountain Rescue Program Coordinator, and we had a uh, drone flight within 100 feet of one of our aircraft while it was doing a hospital-to-hospital -hospital trans uh, transfer, so it's very real. We also, with Alpine Rescue, had an avalanche uh, response, I want to say maybe a month ago, where a drone, you know, in a different situation might have made a difference insofar as the subject um, uh, had an avalanche airbag that turned out to be visible. Now, in this case, there were a bunch of other situations where the drone might not have made a difference. But in this case, the Flight for Life aircraft could not fly. We were grounded because of low ceilings at our bases. Um, this was a very large avalanche debris, but it was also very close to the road. And so there were other people on scene, but, you know, Avalanche, uh, I wanna to add to what uh, Will uh, talked about in that, um, just looking for clues on the surface. A drone, you know, you can see so many more clues from the air than one can while, while trudging through that. So with that, let me um, punch through the questions um, sort of in order. And uh, Will, I'll just turn it over to you. Jim Wallace was asking, whether a part 107 license is required if you're doing sort of public safety search and rescue work in terms of the pilot in command, or is there any waiver? I'm, I'm inferring, I'm taking Jim's question a little bit further, but I infer that Jim is, is asking, you know, in public service, is the 107 still required? So it really comes down to what your local kind of requirements are. I think probably the standard is to have that part 107 as the base, whether or not you're doing flying for your local real estate company, what you have to have, or you're doing your agricultural spraying. Um, but really, we are keeping part 107 as the base. Although some of the things we're doing are outside of that part 107. Um, but I think it really just is part of the best practice to probably have the part 107 for all the PICs and uh, operators that you have in your system. Well, thanks. Um, Harry Patz is asking whether or what I should say are the current maximum range for both line of sight and non light of sight UAS ops. So the line of sight is, uh, if you look at the Part 107 rules, it's basically being able to see your aircraft with an unaided eye. You maybe have a visual observer that can use binoculars or something like that for a brief period of time. If you're following that Part 107 rule you, to the, the letter, you basically need to be able to see it. Kind of beyond that visual line of sight, it's really how far your comm architecture can go from your ground control station to your aircraft. So. Uh, if you're in kind of a deep valley, then you're probably not going to fly very far. But if you're on a It's okay. Let him wear himself out. It's almost the end of the night. Okay. <laughs> I think yeah. I got muted, but. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that a shot. All right. Sorry, Will. Go ahead. I've had to go through the scroll and mute people. Yeah, yeah. No worries. So we were just talking <clears throat> kind of what the visual line of sight is versus beyond visual line of sight. So the visual line of sight is, again, what you're able to see um, with the uh, naked eye. You may be able to visual observer using a set of binoculars for a brief period of time. Uh, but that beyond visual line of sight is really how far your ground control station can reach with the antenna to the aircraft. So if you're in a valley, it's not going to be as far as if you're up on top of a ridge line, but if you're able to do some comms relay from like a, a fixed VTOL that's uh, or fixed uh, fixed wing that's doing a circling kind of pattern above, you might be able to go over the next ridge with a VTOL or a, a rotor craft. Okay, cool. Uh, MRA President Doug McCall was asking whether the trans transponder requirement will apply to every drone, regardless of uh, when it was made, or is it grandfathered? and only the new drones will uh, have that requirement. I think if you're looking at the letter of the law, I'd have to go back to that specific slide, but I think if all the manufacturers for all the new drones have to be complying by September 16th, 2022, and then all UAS pilots must comply by September 16th, 2023, unless you're gonna be in what they're gonna call an FRIA or a FAA recognized identification area, where you don't have to have that uh, remote ID on there. So that's going to be away from airports and things. But um, yeah, by 2023, September, uh, all UAVs and pilots are supposed to be having that from what I understand. All right. Uh, so Nyapathic asks whether it works at night. Can you fly a drone at night? So if you're looking by the part 107, the answer is no, but if you're in kind of the public space, safety space or have another kind of COA or a waiver, um, we are doing some flying at night, like structure fires. Um, it's been able to be uh, see extremely well. Um, we've flown a, a few other times and it gets to be just increasing risk. So I generally don't fly the $25,000 drone at night uh, just because uh, just uh, don't want to crash that. But if, if you saw and notice, I didn't really specifically mention it, but you can actually pre-program flight courses. So that's one of the things that we're talking about potentially doing at our ski area is when we get that lost person call at uh, six o'clock at night, it's getting dark, kind of do a potential fixed flight path and not be able to kind of run into any kind of known structures. Nobody else is flying in the area. So we might be able to get some kind of recon if they go one direction versus the other. So um, we're still working through that, but you can fly at night kind of with the right limitations and the right uh, uh, waivers. You talked about, Will, the, the possibility of losing uh, a, a major investment. My daughter had a, a not so major, several hundred dollar drone that she was doing a commercial project with a uh, uh, company and the uh, unexpected gust of wind at about 10,000 feet took it off. And she was able to download the flight map of exactly where it was when it lost comms with her system. We never did find it, but we at least got in the vicinity. And so keep in mind, folks, if you lose it, and maybe Will, you want to speak to this, you can find a ton of data on, on your last flight. Do you want to address that quickly? And I'll go to the next question. Yeah, so I, I think as I've been talking to more and more people, and, and personally, if, you're, if you've been flying for a while, you've probably lost one. I actually lost one on that uh, uh, July 4th kind of uh, river kind of hasty search. Um, as best as I can tell, I think I had a bird strike and basically hit the drone and dropped it into the water. So uh, if you got parts of your drone, DJI will do some replacement, but if you can't give them anything, they don't give you anything. So uh, yeah, as you're starting to work through some of these higher value platforms, uh, making sure that you got some sort of insurance or a sheriff that's uh, willing to reimburse you. And Will, Steve Wilson from my team, Alpine Rescue, was asking whether the, you know of any grants to help with the more high priced UASs for search and rescue and public service. I don't specifically know, but I'm sure there's probably some out there. It's uh, just being creative in how you write the grants. Um, certainly the big thing that we've found is the partnerships. Um, so it's just for one organization to, to buy kind of the drone and all the parts, um, being able to combine with agencies that have similar kind of that public safety first response interest um, has worked well in our community. Okay, maybe a handful more. Um, let me just 
scroll through chat to make sure I'm caught up. Um, what about any thermal cameras that can see a buried subject or a subject under dense trees, tree canopy, say Pacific Northwest? Yeah, the, the thermals have been okay. So like, as we saw the thermal with the person floating down the river, um, that pops out well. Um, we've done a couple other kind of uh, lost person searches with uh, law enforcement of person of interest. Um, and they've, it's not been as successful as kind of you'd want. So it's really kind of that delta temperature change. Uh, you really need to have a fairly close line of sight. You need to be fairly close to the ground. Um, and so there's still significant limitations penetrating through canopies and things like that. Um, we've done a little bit with, but it's, it's not as optimal as I would hope. Um, thinking about trying to pair some of the, the military technologies <clears throat> to bring those to the commercial spaces um, would help with some of that, but uh, those technologies aren't quite mature yet. Okay, a couple of questions from Jonah Blossom. One, a um, little more details to how you coordinate with other aviation assets, and I infer from that question, you know, search and rescue helicopters and anybody else that's going to be sharing the airspace. Yeah, so <clears throat> I've got both a flight band radio as well as kind of the, the comms plan that we have with our local aircraft. Um, so again, kind of having that pre-plan is really important. So if we don't have comms, um, we basically kind of ground kind of operations until we get those comms linked up. Um, so yeah, it's just making sure that kind of whatever your pre-plan is that you're able to follow it and then kind of what your abort is as well, just to make sure you're deconflicting that airspace. Yeah, I should also add that uh, with Flight for Life, when a request comes in from an AHJ or search and rescue team uh, for our aircraft to launch, um, we have a checklist of, I want to say, 15 questions, uh, Latin long, you know, what's the mission? And one of them is always, are there any drones uh, currently flying or expected to be flying? And if so, our comm center needs a call right away. So second question, um, what about airborne repeaters? Um, and I, I'm, I'm inferring by that, um, you know, sort of radio relays. And there was a presentation, I think it was up in Oregon when we were up at Timberline two years ago by a group that was working on radio relay systems that where drones can be uh, go airborne and, and serve as repeaters. But uh, Will, you probably know more about that. Yeah, I mean, those are the more concepts that we're kind of working towards. We don't have any current fixed wings, but I think those are the kind of really the, the aircraft that are going to be really more capable for that, for the higher loiter times. Uh, if you start looking at some of the, the military aircraft, they got carbon fiber fuel tanks and they've got 12 hour loiter times. Um, so we're in, in the commercial space, just waiting for that to come up. Um, some of the fixed wing platforms are out there. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, the fixed wings generally need to have kind of a bigger takeoff space and catchment. Um, so when you kind of take off and land, um, but there are starting to be a couple of VTOLs so you can vertically take off and land, um, but then you can switch to forward air flight as a fixed wing. And so those are gonna be some kind of new capabilities I'm gonna look at. Um, I'm sure there's probably some more kind of communications experts that kind of would know how to attach kind of the, the relay, the repeater onto that, but uh, um, those are still kind of that, that next step on the horizon for us. Well, questions are lining up, so I'm going to forego telling you who's asking them all, but um, any experience with SGI waiver to fly in wilderness or at, at night or anything like that? So wilderness areas, uh, I think it probably just is the same that we would use for manned aircraft, kind of life, limb, or eyesight with the uh, um, whoever's having uh, ability to kind of make that decision for wilderness areas. Um, for the dark, if you're working through these things, the FAA has got a 24 seven number to get almost in instantaneous kind of waivers for certain, uh, things, um, flying over crowds was one of those things that was kind of, kind of forbidden, even kind of with difficulty getting waivers, but those are starting to change a little bit. Um, so again, there's, uh, kind of these things are definitely on the change. So as you're working through these, as you're developing your program, uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff to keep up on. Bill Axon from uh, Alaska, fixed wing pilot with God knows how many thousands of hours, did point out that uh, DMR digital radio on the SAR channel weighs about a pound and a half and could potentially work uh, as a receiver. Um, keep going, let's see, drone work well for a mission close to 
Canadian border last Tuesday. Folks look in chat, you'll see a link to that. Um, be able to get permanent waivers for flying at night. Maybe you just answered that. Um, they've only got specific locations and specific timelines for that. Do you want to elaborate at all, Will? Yeah, that's going to change a little bit. So some of the new kind of final rules are making that a little bit more expanded kind of in your initial co or your waivers. Um, so that's, yeah, probably a little bit more deep for if you're really looking into that, uh, you really need to get your agency kind of with your waivers and your COAs and figure out kind of what you're going to be doing, what you're approved for versus a blanket waiver versus kind of an individual mission waiver. Well, there's a note in chat also from Chuck Rosner that FAA is coming out with a new online course and some tests that will allow for for night. So um, let's see, I see another repeater question, comment, um, and a reminder from President Doug McCall, please everybody go to the MRA Slack channel because there's a discussion group for, for drones. Oh, cool. Um, and so um, let's see, let me just get to a couple of more and then we're gonna shut it down, but I think there's only a few more. Um, a report on a multispectral camera being able to detect a form in a shallow grave, pit cemetery. Um, it was in a field without a real tree canopy. So that's just a comment. Um, let's see, John Soul from Utah. John, I'm in your backyard uh, tonight. Don't think there is a repeater for the frequencies encoding used by drones. I imagine that's going to start happening soon. Um, and let me just scroll through just a couple more. Some of this is back and forth from folks. If you're interested in the um, MRE Slack channel, Doug McCall posted a link. Um, and then uh, the last question I see, and then I'm going to take personal privilege and ask a couple of my own. Do you run an in-house 107 pilot training program, Will? Uh, no. Well, <clears throat> not specifically. So uh, I think it was Remote Pilot 101. So it's an online one that you pay uh, some money for, but it really kind of trains you up. Um, we Once you get that, then we're doing some kind of self-training, um, being able to go out uh, we definitely need to take it up to this next step and maintain proficiencies and things, but we're still kind of in those initial uh, programmatic steps. But the the remote uh, pilot 101 is what I did, and there's several of the other ones out there. Um, some of the companies that sell drones have different test banks and things like that for public safety for free. Um, so there's a lot of different options and opportunities out there. Cool. And I noticed from John Soul that uh, he was noticing and or noting, and others should be aware that. Uh, Weaver State Search and Rescue in uh, Utah does have a 107 in-house training program, so folks might want to consider that. And who knows if uh, maybe, John, with your help, we uh, create a new one as an MRA training program. Yeah, that's um, definitely possible, too. Yeah, well, as I look at my own notes, I see that most of them got answered by Q&A, but um, what, two questions on battery flight, the battery time limits. Do you see that improving over time? Obviously, with motor vehicles and other things, we're seeing improvements over rechargeable rate, uh, batteries. Do you see that improving over time? Yeah, I think that technology is definitely one of the, the improvements that's already been going, but I think it's going to keep going. <clears throat> Just being able to get more kind of bang for your buck in kind of each one of the batteries. Um, the, the flight times and yeah, just the capabilities as the technology continues to develop. Last thing I'll add and as we as we close out, but the last sort of comment question, um, you know, speaking for a helicopter program that has five uh, helicopters that cover 54 mountains in Colorado over 14,000 feet, I know our biggest enemy is high and hot. Mm -hmm. um, so our ability to fly and fly for long periods of time is going to be limited by weather. Is battery life, I assume, impacted on a drone in similar situations? When you guys are flying around the Grand Teton um, high and hot, your battery life must drain a lot faster. You want to speak to that? And that's our last question that I see. Yeah, I mean, I'm not flowing up to like the 13, 14,000 feet, um, but yeah, definitely all the kind of rotor speeds, RPMs, all those things that would affect kind of manned aircraft are going to affect the drone, trying to maintain the drone kind of with this GPS location for winds that are pushing on it, all those different things. Um, those are all going to affect that as well. Well, and certainly cold. Thank you, John, for reminding us that uh, cold is going to impact battery life. 
And uh, George Jansen reminds us Colorado State University has a drone center um, that, uh, um, that can teach part 107. Last comment that's being made, I've flown a Mavic 2 at, at 13,000 feet and got 20 minutes plus flight time. Yeah. Dr. One Will things, Smith, yeah. we are, so go ahead, sorry, you had- uh, I was gonna say that one comment on the batteries, um, they've actually got their in-cell heating, um, so they're actually smart batteries, so they've actually got better than average time um, for kind of battery degradation with temperature, but it does take a little bit of that battery to keep itself heated up, but they, they are able to work pretty well in the cold. Sure. I see a lot of comments back and forth from folks who know a lot about drones, so I'm just gonna let, I'm gonna, as we say thanks to Dr. Smith, I'm going to leave this um, this this program open for a little while, so anyone that wants to scroll through the uh, chat can do so. But Dr. Will Smith, what a privilege to have you on with us tonight. Thank you for your expertise, both at the local level in uh, Montana and Wyoming, at the uh, national level with the National Park Service, and now most recently at the international level with the new ICAR work group. I don't know where you find the time to play around with your kids, but uh, we appreciate the time you give us. They love playing with drones too, so it makes it a family yeah, affair. Actually, you, you picked a toy <laughs> that kids enjoy working with, so appreciate you, my friend. Thank you so much for everything. Folks, watch for the recording. I'm on the road, so it may take us a couple of days, but it'll be up on the MRA website. And Will Smith, thank you, uh, and thanks everybody for joining us. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Have a good night. See you next time. Thanks, everybody.